Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, masks off. President Biden today is expected to announce updated recommendations from the CDC on whether vaccinated Americans need to mask up while outdoors. We'll preview that latest guidance. On edge, a state of emergency has been declared in the North Carolina city where Andrew Brown Jr. was shot and killed by police serving an arrest warrant ahead of the possible release of body camera footage of the incident. How Brown's family is reacting to the redacted clips they were shown by law enforcement. Get out the voters. We have new NBC polling on what Americans think about voter access and restrictions. How confident are you in our free and fair elections? And Stranger Than Fiction, scripted television shows still in production are now facing a reality check. Confront the coronavirus on screen or ignore it. How one show is tackling the pandemic head on. No, Joe, I don't really know that I want to see this on TV or in movies or relive any of it. It's interesting when you see some of the masks in TV shows, yes. how inconsistent it is. Oh, like they're absolutely. wearing masks in one scene and not in another. Absolutely. Like, yeah. It does, though, sort of shock you when you see people without masks in a movie or TV in a big group. I'm like, oh. Yeah. We used to be able to do that. It's an imaginary world. <laughs> Maybe one day soon again. Yeah. We'll get to that later, but we begin with more signs of a return to normalcy. President Biden is expected to announce new CDC guidance on wearing masks outside. That announcement could come later today. NBC News has learned that guidance for fully vaccinated Americans will be different from the guidance for those who are not fully inoculated. Right now, the U.S. is getting closer to having a third of its population fully vaccinated against the virus. Nearly 96 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. More than 42 percent of the population has received at least one dose. We're covering every angle of this major shift. Joining us now, NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece and NBC News health and medical reporter Erica Edwards. So, Shannon, let's start with you. What is the White House saying about Biden's announcement? What can we expect? Right. Well, I will say that we don't know specifically what this guidance is going to include, what the details of it will be. Uh, But officials familiar with this have told NBC News that they can we can expect to hear President Biden likely today address this issue of mask wearing outdoors, as well as further guidance potentially about what people who are vaccinated can do. Now, this all comes as Biden is approaching his hundred day in office, hundredth day in office. And we know that the president has has been telling people to wear a mask for his first 100 days. My colleagues and I have repeatedly asked the White House, well, what happens after those 100 days? A slight change in mask guidance, potentially outdoors or other recommendations for people who are fully vaccinated could be an effort to show that progress is being made. Things are going in the right direction. And of course, an encouragement for people to get vaccinated. And Erica, help us out from a medical perspective here. Remind us what the CDC guidance currently says about masks outdoors and their reasoning behind that guidance. Well, right now, the guidance is actually pretty muddled. Um, it, It really defers to your own state, local or federal mask mandates. There's really no guidance that says that masks may not be necessary if you're outside alone with your immediate family. The problem is it's led to a lot of confusion among Americans who still really aren't sure when to mask, when not to mask, when it's safe to do so. That's why now is a really good time to clarify the guidance. We have millions of people who are vaccinated. They have cabin fever. They're ready to get outside and enjoy the spring weather safely. And Erica, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been hinting at a change in outdoor mask guidance for a few days. Here's what he said yesterday. The risk of infection outside um, is really minimum. If you're vaccinated and you're outside, it's even less. So what we're going to be doing through the CDC is soon, very soon, clarifying the situation vis-a-vis masks in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. So stay tuned. It's coming. So if you're vaccinated, the risk is different. Reading the tea leaves, what could this guidance look like? Well, we do expect some relaxation in mask guidance for people who are fully vaccinated when they are outdoors, um, hiking, biking, exercising, gathering with small groups of friends. The guidance will not address every scenario or situation. There are a few key things to kind of keep in mind. First of all, nothing is fully, right? But we can take a look about how the virus spread in the past and apply a really healthy dose of common sense. If you're fully vaccinated, that means you've had 
two doses of either Moderna and Pfizer, or one dose of Johnson and Johnson. That means that you can, you know, your, your risk is much lower. Outdoors is better. Um, and uh, if you find yourself indoors and it's getting a little crowded, go ahead and put the mask back on. It certainly can't hurt. That's great advice there. Now, Shannon, of course, all of this really depends on getting more people vaccinated. But demand is actually slowing. And the CDC says nearly five million people at this point did not show up for that second dose of their vaccine. What's the White House saying about the current state of the vaccine rollout to really make all of this make any sense? Well, they certainly acknowledge that we're moving into a next phase of vaccination away from those really eager people and the really high risk people. And now we're getting into uh, a group that they say, um, you know, at best is going to need just a little nudge and at worst is going to need some real serious con- convincing. For that group that just might need a little nudge, uh, the White House is trying to do things like send the vaccine to more retail pharmacies or primary care doctors so it's easier for people to get vaccinated. They don't have to go to a big mass vaccination center. Uh, We heard President Biden last week calling for employers to offer paid time off or bonuses or incentives. Uh, The White House has been talking to companies about doing vaccination clinics for their workers. But of course, for that really vaccine-hesitant group, uh, there continues to be a real heavy information campaign coming from the White House and trying to get groups involved to particularly to target uh, conservatives, Republicans, people in rural areas that polls indicate are the most vaccine hesitant, like NASCAR and the National Evangelical Association. All right, Shannon and Erica, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Bob Lajita joins us now. He's the director of the Institute for Autoimmune and Rheumatic Diseases at St. Joseph Health. Dr. Lajita, always great to have you. And one of the many reasons that we love having you is because we know you are a straight shooter. You're going to tell us what we need to know, but you're also going to help us just understand it and help us kind of wade through all this. And this one is a debate. I mean, people are, of course, tired of wearing masks, but people know that they're keeping us safe. But then when we think about the fact that we're outside and we've always known that that's where we're safer, I understand why people are wondering what's going on here. We also know that much of the guidance that we've been receiving has started quite conservatively while we learn more. So tell us what rules here make sense to you? Well, Savannah, you you hit on a very good point. You know, if I look at the map of the United States, which is color coded by those states who allow uh, people to drop their masks completely versus those that make us wear our masks, you'll note that in the Northeast and and the West, we're mandated to wear masks at all times. But in the South, like Texas, Arizona, Florida, have dropped the mask completely. I'm expecting the president to use the common sense that Dr. Fauci uh, brought up, and that is that when you're outside, you shouldn't have to wear the mask, particularly if you're vaccinated. It simply means that airflow is so good that the chances of infection are probably minuscule. And, And we've always thought that, and that's why people go to restaurants and they eat outside and the the air you know is has got to be flowing if you're indoors in a restaurant and you're vaccinated you shouldn't have to wear a mask if you've got good ventilation and the key here is vaccination many many people you know savannah just don't want to get vaccinated like 20 percent of the population and i'm very dismayed by the group the several million people who have not had their second shot yet because that's kind of that's a roll of the dice. You know, we want you to have that booster shot. There's a reason for the second shot. And if you don't get it, you may not be fully vaccinated. So, Dr. Bob, let's pick it up right there, because I think part of the issue here is maybe, you know, if you're vaccinated and if you're outside and you take your mask off, you have this knowledge that that we think we hope that we are safe. We have some immunity. But of course, you don't know about those people around you. And we do know, like you just said, about this hesitancy issue. So we're so used to wearing masks everywhere we go, inside, outside. If we're fully vaccinated and you take your mask off outdoors, what does it mean both for you, but also for those around us? What's the science here on what's safe? Well, it's safe because you're not going to transmit the virus and you're not going to get sick from getting the virus from someone else. But if you're around people who may not be vaccinated, it would be prudent for you to continue to wear the mask and keep your social distancing. If you're with your friends and you're jogging in a group where you have all been vaccinated, there's no need to wear a mask. If you're in your house with your family members 
who have all been vaccinated, except for little children who don't need to be vaccinated right now. You're fine without wearing a mask and just carrying on with your normal lives. So I think the president's going to make it very clear that this is based on science and the CDC works with data. And that's what's most important, Savannah. So, Dr. Lahida, you just mentioned an example of being indoors, still with that family unit and if you're all vaccinated. But where does the vaccine yes. rollout need to be in order to lift an indoor mask mandate in general? Quickly, when do you think that could be possible? Oh, boy. Well, that's that's a tough one. I think when we have we so far have, as you mentioned, 28.5 percent of the of the population. We want to get to herd immunity, and I say that often, and that's between 70 to 80 percent of the population either being vaccinated or having been infected. Once we get to herd immunity, we can all drop our mask and live our lives normally like we did in the past. But that is a wish, and that is not a reality at this time. Dr. Lahida, I don't love when you start an answer with, oh, boy, but we do love always having you. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thanks, Savannah. More than one year after Louisville police shot and killed Breonna Taylor while carrying out a no-knock warrant, the Justice Department has announced that it's launched an investigation into the city's policing practices. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams has more. There's little doubt that this investigation would not be happening if it weren't for the death of Breonna Taylor in March of last year. She's the health care worker who was shot to death in her own apartment by police during a botched effort to serve a search warrant. Her death was one of the catalysts for a summer of nationwide Black Lives Matter protests. Now the Justice Department says it will investigate the Louisville Police Department, the entire department, to see if there's a pattern or practice of violating civil rights. It'll look at whether Louisville police have a pattern of using unreasonable force, including against peaceful protesters, of engaging in racial discrimination in traffic stops or of illegally searching private homes. Police were carrying out a no-knock search when Breonna Taylor was killed. The investigation will also look at how police are trained and supervised and how they're held accountable when things go wrong. Both Louisville's mayor and police chief say they welcome the Justice Department's investigation. The chief, Erica Shields, says she thinks it's a good idea because police reform is needed in nearly every agency across the country. With last week's announcement about Minneapolis, this now makes two new civil rights investigations of police departments since Attorney General Merrick Garland rescinded a Trump administration policy, one that made it nearly impossible to open these kinds of civil rights investigations. And Justice Department officials say there will be more of these police, uh, police department investigations to come. Joe, Savannah? Thank you, Pete. In North Carolina, the family of a man who was shot and killed by sheriff's deputies serving an arrest warrant on felony drug charges last week says they were shown 20 seconds of the body cam footage. They say the video showed Andrew Brown Jr. with his hands on the steering wheel of his car before he died. NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders is in Elizabeth City with more on that video and the fallout. Well, good morning, Savannah and Joe. We'll now be up to a judge at the courthouse here to determine whether the body camera videos recorded by the deputies at the scene will all be released. At this point, all they have are one 20-second video that the family has viewed. The family and their lawyers say that is far from enough, but still, they believe what they have seen is evidence that the deputies overreacted. <laughs> Night, peaceful protests again in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Andrew Brown's family demanding that authorities in Pasquotank County release all the body camera footage from his fatal shooting at the hands of deputies last week. The sheriff's office gave the family and their lawyers a private viewing, but the family says they were only allowed to see one 20-second clip. And what did you say? Uh, execution. Execution. Yes. Describe it. It's horrific. You know, you see a person trying to get away and the cops shooting at them. You know, that's not right. He was in no harm at all. And it's very clear in the video. Family lawyers believe there may be as many as nine body cams as well as dash cams. They say the video appears to show Brown with his hands on his car's steering wheel before he was killed and that he was shot from behind. But a black person being shot in the back 
is almost like a cliche in America. These grainy images snapped by a witness show the aftermath. Brown's windshield with at least four bullet holes. The shooting unfolded early Wednesday when deputies were attempting to serve a warrant on Brown for allegedly selling illegal drugs. Ashley Bechtel, married to Brown's cousin, says she witnessed it happen from her upstairs bedroom. They crowded around his car. They sh- shot, were shooting the front window of his car. Seven deputies have been placed on administrative administrative leave while authorities investigate. This tragic incident was quick and over in less than 30 seconds and body cameras are shaky and sometimes hard to decipher. Andrew Brown did what you teach your children to do when we have the talk, which is to comply. He put his hands on the steering wheel when he was being shot. Lawyers for the family say that Andrew Brown had no gun, no drugs. The sheriff's department is yet to release any details of what happened. Guys, back to you. Gary Sanders, thank you. Now to a concerning find off the coast of California. Marine scientists at the Scripps Oceanography Lab announced Monday they found more than 27,000 barrels dumped on the ocean floor off the coast of Los Angeles. The chief scientist of the expedition says the area has been a dumping ground for industrial waste for decades, and he says it has previously been found to contain high levels of DDT. The toxic chemical has been found in marine animals like dolphins and sea lions. The LA Times is reporting that California editor Diane Feinstein is going to ask the Justice Department to investigate companies that may have illegally dumped this waste into the ocean and to see if they can be held accountable. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC News correspondent Sarah Harmon is with us this morning from London. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to both of you. Let's start things off right here in the UK, where British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is facing mounting fury over comments that he allegedly made last year during the height of the country's coronavirus pandemic. UK media are reporting that Johnson said he would rather see, quote, bodies pile high in their thousands rather than impose a third lockdown. Boris Johnson has flatly denied that he made those remarks. To Italy now, where the country is coming out of lockdown and cafe owners in Venice are hoping for a few customers. This week, restaurants in many parts of the country are finally allowed to open for outdoor dining. But international tourists are still rare in Venice, which means locals get a rare chance to enjoy the city themselves. Finally, guys, check out this supermoon that lit up skylines around the world last night. A supermoon occurs when a full moon is at its closest point to Earth, and last night's was pretty special, a pink supermoon visible from Australia to Istanbul to right here in London. Joe, Savannah? I think we were supposed to be able to see it in New York, but it was past my bedtime, so maybe we can ask <laughs> I, Paul Karen. I just always laugh when people try to take pictures of the moon with their phone. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> it's like work I, at all. It does <laughs> not don't turn bother. out. Just enjoy the moment. All right. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get a check on your morning news now, weather. Bill Karen, do you know anything about that? It was like 8 o'clock when the moon came up over the horizon. You were in bed by 8? <laughs> oh, I read that it wasn't going to really reveal itself until 1130, and I can't really see it from my windows. Oh. I would have had to go outside, so I just kind of gave up early. <laughs> I didn't realize it was like a like a fashion show, like a big reveal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, it's got music, a runway, all sorts of things. It's, <laughs> uh, it was gorgeous and it was huge. I did see it come up over the tree line. It was gorgeous. It did look really nice. Uh, it wasn't pink, though, by the way. And they're not blue when they're blue moons either, just in case anyone was really confused. OK, uh, so let's get into this forecast. The middle of the country, uh, warm and windy once again today. We are going to deal with some severe storms over the next couple of days. So for today, if we have anyone that's going to get any damage from severe storms. It'll likely be from large hail from Lubbock to areas of, uh, well, it's almost Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls, Del Rio. I think Dallas and San Antonio, you're okay today, but tomorrow on Wednesday, that's when you'll have a better chance of getting some of those stronger storms. Isolated tornado here or there, but large hail is kind of the threat over the next two days. And the timing of it, as we watch throughout the day today, not a lot of storms by 6 p.m., just hit and miss near Oklahoma City and between San Antonio and Dallas. It's Wednesday afternoon. 
afternoon, the concentration of storms will be much greater. Notice that soaking rain from Missouri all the way through Oklahoma and isolated storms to the south. And as advertised, guys, here it comes. 84 degrees today in Washington, D.C., 84 in Chicago. Wait for it on Wednesday. It arrives in the Big, Big Apple with 81 at least. So, uh, yeah, pretty warm for the mid to late April. Yeah. Those air conditioners to the test. All right. Thank <laughs> you, Bill. Yeah, we need an update from both of you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Coming up, we're going to check in with some of the Florida voters we last spoke to before the 2020 election. How do they feel about where things stand at the Biden administration's 100 day mark? That's up next. The 2020 election might be over, but the Democratic Party's fight to flip states that former President Trump won is just beginning. Democrats are hoping one of the most crucial counties in Florida could help turn the state blue in 2024. It's a Democratic stronghold, but one where Republicans made significant gains last year helping Trump carry the state. This morning, the NBC News County to County Tour finds correspondent Ellison Barber in South Florida, her home away from home. Welcome back, Ellison. <laughs> you met up again with voters you talked to before the election. That includes a mother-daughter duo that split their votes. One went red, one went blue. Folks may remember them from the NBC town hall last year. So what are they saying about President Biden's first 100 days? Either of them changed their minds about how they voted? Yes. Yeah, so both of them said if they could go back to November of 2020, knowing everything they know right now, they would both still cast their ballots the same way for the mom. That meant voting for Trump, the daughter voting for Biden. Here's some of what they had to say about Biden's first 100 days. Listen here. There are some good things and there's some bad things, as with any president. I think he's uh, definitely um, brought the drama down in the political scene uh, in the United States, which is a good thing. The border crisis is something that's spun out of control and that's being downplayed by the administration. I definitely agree with my mom on the first half. I think Biden is doing a really great job of bringing the drama down. His message throughout his campaign was being the unifying president. And obviously that's not something that's going to happen overnight, but I do see the seeds of that starting to grow, which I think is really great. When you have Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, saying that he has exceeded her expectations in his first 100 days, that makes me shudder. Now, the mom did say that she is not, in her words, one of these people who doesn't think Biden won the election. She said she does not doubt that. He is her president, though. You heard her talk about some of the frustration she had there. She said as a as a daughter of immigrants, she's very frustrated with what's happening at the border. She has concerns about his tax proposals. The daughter and the mom had a very spirited discussion about who uh, deserves credit for where things are in terms of COVID vaccinations in the United States. The mom saying Trump deserves credit. The daughter saying absolutely not. We would not be where we are if not for the Biden administration. Joe. Sounds a lot like the entire country right now. Now, Ellison voters didn't just choose a president. They voted for a ticket with two candidates. So what are people saying about Vice President Harris? And also, how do they feel about the president's cabinet picks? Yeah, another one of the people that we spoke to, and we spoke to all of these people prior to the election and the weeks and months leading up to it. But one of the people that we spoke to is a young woman who is about to graduate college uh, from Florida Memorial University, which is an HBCU in the Miami area. And she said basically that representation matters. She said, obviously, Biden, as a white man, has not lived the experiences she has lived. He cannot understand what her life has been like. But caring is important, surrounding himself with people who have lived experiences like her, that that matters. And in her view, that translates to policies that better represent all of America. Listen here. He has a cabinet full of diverse individuals. Our vice president is African-American and a part of a black sorority from an HBCU. So I see it in the everything, everyday things that he does, and I appreciate those efforts. And I don't need a president that's afraid to speak for me. I need a president that is willing and able to stand up for my rights and my beliefs. One thing that was interesting and stood out to me that she said was that she feels safer today than she did 100, 200 days, days ago. And, and she says that is obviously an ever changing process. And there are a lot of challenges in America, particularly for black Americans right now. But she said under this administration, she feels like her life has gotten better and she personally feels safer. Joe. 
Ellison, we know the country remains deeply divided. We just saw that with the mom and daughter there. What are voters saying about that 100 days into this administration? Yeah, I mean, the mom who we saw at the beginning who supported President Trump, she doesn't feel like Joe Biden has done a great job uniting the country, even though that was a big part of his campaign. He promised that he would be someone who could bring the country together, be the uniter in chief, if you will. But others who did vote for him say that's going to be a really long process. We knew how divided this country was well before the election and that it takes time. Listen here. For Biden to unite the country, it will take a miracle because Americans are very divided. Um, I do appreciate that Biden is making a concerted effort um, to unify and he's speaking about it and he cares about unity. And I think that's a great first step. Everybody we spoke to said they will be watching and watching closely Biden's address to Congress on Wednesday. Joe. Sounds good. Allison Barber, thank you so much. Out this morning, new NBC polling on how Americans view voter access at the polls. It found 58 percent of Americans say they are more concerned with making sure that everyone who wants to vote can do so. And only 38 percent are more concerned with making sure that no one votes who is not eligible to vote. NBCNews.com senior reporter Jane Tim joins us now. Jane, good morning. So break down what else we're learning here. What are Americans saying? Yeah, yeah, there's really interesting partisan divide in this polling. And I'm going to look at my notes because I want to get this exactly right. Um, 87% of Democratic voters prioritize voting access over concerns of ineligible people voting. As you said, this this tracks with how we understand Democrats who who worry about voter suppression a lot. Um, But Republicans, it's the exact flip. 77 percent of Republican voters prioritize making sure ineligible people cannot vote more than making sure everybody can vote who is eligible to vote. Uh, Now, independent voters side with Democrats a bit more on this issue, though not as strongly, of course. Um, Really, really interesting partisan divide. And you have to believe this has something to do with how Donald Trump has been talking to his voters and telling them that voter fraud is a real big issue. And one of the other things that we've heard is that states weren't properly managing elections. So does this polling tell us anything about how confident people are in that? Overall, Americans are pretty confident in their state's ability to run elections. But again, really strong partisan divide comes back here, whereas Republicans who live in blue states were significantly less confident in their state's ability to run the election than Democrats who live in red states, so states that voted for Donald Trump. Uh, That partisan divide, I can't get over that. I'll be thinking about that all day. (laughs) Now, Jane, also, what does this polling tell us about how this all breaks down by race? You know, black and brown voters tend to be more uh, more prioritized, rather, the ability of their state to let people vote more than, you know, worrying about keeping ineligible people from voting. So that's where we saw voters of color said more. They prioritize that issue more than they do sort of voter fraud issues. Uh, and white voters evenly split. And this this tracks with just the, how much that voters of color tend to be impacted by laws that are designed to prevent voter fraud. All right, Jane Tim, thank you so much. Hundreds of bills targeting LGBTQ Americans have been filed in state legislatures this year, according to the Human Rights Campaign. So far, eight of those bills have become law, and 10 more are sitting on the desks of governors waiting for a signature. LGBTQ advocates warn this wave of bills could create a state of crisis with more legislation of this kind this year than the last three years combined. NBC Out Associate Editor Joe Yurkeva joins us now with more on where states stand on this legislation. So, Joe, as I just said, eight state, eight bills have been signed into law. Many more could be signed. Most of them are centered on transgender minors. Can you tell us a little more about some of this legislation? Which states are we talking about here? Yes. So governors in five states, um, that's Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama and South Dakota, have signed measures to ban transgender girls from competing on school sports teams that align with their gender. And then Arkansas is also the first state in the country to ban transition-related care for minors, and that includes hormones and puberty blockers, uh, though Alabama and Texas are also considering similar measures. Now, Joe, what are the arguments made by some of the lawmakers behind this legislation? Why do they think these laws are necessary? 
Well, the athlete bans are predicated on the idea that trans girls are going to hurt women's sports and schools, but governors in almost all of these states haven't been able to name a single instance of trans girls causing controversy in school sports. Um, as for the medical care bans, major medical associations like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association say that those bills are based on misinformation and actually go against best practice guidelines for treating trans minors. And Joe, the human rights campaign and other LGBTQ advocates are really aggressively fighting these bills. Tell us some of the things they're doing and what's their main message. So the human rights campaign is trying to get major businesses and sports organizations such as the NCAA to put economic pressure on states that are considering these bills and threaten to pull business or championship games out of these states. Their main message is that these bills will hurt young kids like 11-year-old Libby Gonzalez, who I spoke to and whom you can see here. She said that if a medical care ban in Texas, for example, passes, that she wants to disappear. So advocates are really fighting for kids like her. I know there's been a lot of grassroots efforts in state legislatures to try and get at lawmakers or get at governors to try and persuade them. Some of these bills have actually been vetoed. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, Arkansas Governor Aza Hutchinson vetoed the medical care ban before the Arkansas legislature overrode it. And governors recently in North Dakota, Arizona and Kansas have also vetoed bills. All right. Joe, you're okay, but thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, New Jersey's governor is rolling back COVID restrictions in the state once again. We'll chat with a local business owner on what that means for their bottom line. Here's an important story I wanted to make sure you heard about this morning. This week, the FDA will decide whether to ban menthol in cigarettes. Experts say the cooling flavor in the cigarettes makes it easier to start smoking. Health advocates argue the ban would improve the health of black Americans. Eighty five percent of black smokers smoke menthol flavored cigarettes and black men have the highest lung cancer death rate in the country. Now, it's unclear if other menthol flavored tobacco products like e-cigs would be affected by the ban, which could take years to be implemented. But Savannah, those statistics are really eye opening and show just how big of a problem this is. Again, it's not something that would happen overnight, but mm -hmm. would take some time to implement. Yeah, they absolutely are. It's good to hear about certain things that can help in this way, especially if, you know, they're available to us to do so. Thanks, Joe. Back now on the COVID front, New Jersey residents could soon be back on the dance floor. Governor Phil Murphy unveiled a series of changes that will loosen restrictions for both outdoor and indoor gatherings. The move includes new guidance for proms, graduations and weddings. MSNBC's Yasmin Vesugian joins us now from Hoboken, New Jersey. Yasmin, good morning. So what's expected in New Jersey? What does it mean for people there? What's the new guidance? Um, it means a lot more openings come May 10th. We're not back on the dance floor just yet, Savannah. You do seem excited for that um, opening happening, as I am I'm getting back on the dance floor this summer. But uh, we're not there quite yet. As of May 10th, a lot of these restrictions are going to be lifted. Let me talk you through some of those. 500 now outdoor capacity. You got 50 percent capacity in stadiums uh, with at least 1,000 seats. But when you're with your family there, you still have to be six feet apart uh, from other families as well. Proms, for instance, I mean, think about it. we're into April. Prom season comes May and June, obviously, as the end of the school year wraps up. Proms are now going to be able to happen. Indoor uh, capacity is going to be at 50 percent, up to 250 people. As you mentioned, dance floors opening up at private event, indoor spaces, not necessarily at nightclubs and bars as of yet. But here was the governor just yesterday talking about um, some of the openings that he anticipates happening over the next couple of weeks and what he anticipates happening in the future as well. Take a listen. We have been eager to relax our restrictions as soon as the numbers gave us confidence that we could do so safely and responsibly. And that time has come. And I would hope that this these are the first set of announcements of, I hope, many sets of announcements over the next number of weeks. So, by the way, you think about summer being around the corner, right? Carnivals as well are going to be at 50 percent capacity. And as you heard the governor saying there, um, it's just a matter of time. They're hoping to announce more openings come uh, Memorial Day weekend. But you think about Savannah this time last year, right? At this time mm. last year, we were in full lockdown mode mm -hmm. really across this country. 
on a federal level, people were anticipating proms not happening, graduations not happening. How many people did you know at that time saying that they had to have drive-in graduations, drive-through graduations? They were just completely canceled. It was a really tough year for a lot of folks um, that had those events that they were anticipating for so long. But a light at this point, or a dance floor, I should say, at the end of the <laughs> yeah, tunnel. Yeah, yeah, Yasin, um, May 10th, that's pretty soon. <laughs> that's pretty soon. We can hold on for yeah, the dance floor is, for a couple soon. more weeks. Um, also, hold Yasin, on. <laughs> now that these events are back, proms, weddings, I mean, that means venue rentals, that means catering, that means flowers. Are, are businesses thrilled about this? They're so thrilled. They're so thrilled. I'm standing in front of Hudson Table right now. They offer cooking classes here. They have baby showers here. Um, a lot of folks have rehearsal dinners, really small weddings um, in this area as well. They have a couple different locations, I believe, Hoboken. Uh, they have a location in Brooklyn and in Philly as well. Um, they've had a really tough year financially, having had to apply for PPP loans. Um, you know, they were not able to have many events over the last year. I believe the owner who I spoke to a little bit earlier said um, normally they have hundreds of events every single year. In the last year, they've had 10 to 15 events. That is it. Mm. And he actually wow. showed up. Thankfully, early this morning, I was able to talk to him uh, briefly about his reaction to some of these openings and how that's going to affect his business going forward. Let's take a listen to Alan. We do a lot of um, events, bridal showers, baby showers, rehearsal dinners. We do some small weddings. So now that we could do 50 percent, um, that gets us to about 30 and 25 in each of our two kitchens. Um, so we're finally able to do some of the bigger scale events because 30 is sort of our sweet spot, I would say, in terms of event size. Um, plus we have sort of this outdoor space, so now we can kind of combine the two. Um, but it's huge for us because obviously there's a big backlog of uh, private events and private parties and people wanting to sort of host the showers that they couldn't host a year ago. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of unknowns for businesses like this. I was asking Alan, what do you do today waking up knowing that these restrictions are being lifted? Are you calling up some of your clients and saying, hey, look, you can increase your guest list if you want? And he said they've been taking mm. it day by day. I mean, everybody knows how difficult this last year has been in planning these types of events. But obviously, folks in this area who have been hard hit, these small businesses, especially that have been hard hit over the last year, really anticipating the fact that they're going to be able to make some money back and have some of those big events they had been planning for. Yeah, you know, Yasmin, I bet it's going to be quite difficult to get a wedding date now if you want one, because everybody who wasn't able to for the last year is going to be rushing to do so. So they'll be happy about that, at least. Now, Yasmin, of course, the flip side of this is that as restrictions ease, do cases rise? Is New Jersey concerned about that, especially being among the hardest hit states in the country? I mean, I don't think New Jersey is the only state that's concerned about that. States across the country are concerned about that. New York just, you know through the tunnel is concerned about that as well I'm, as more openings are happening um, every single day. If you think about it, New Jersey had a major spike just last month. I mean, I remember reporting on New Jersey spiking cases and how we can anticipate um, that affecting the vaccine rollout in this state. But now they're seeing the numbers of cases and hospitalizations in this state going down, as the governor talked about yesterday. And they think that it's a good time to begin these reopenings to allowing more capacity Uh, when it comes to indoor dining as well. But of course, they're going to continue to watch those numbers. And if they do trend downwards, they'll continue to reopen certain venues, allowing more and more capacity. But of course, if those numbers do go back up, they're going to have to reevaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about vaccinations, 2.7 million folks have been fully vaccinated in this state. That's still not hitting the governor's goal of 4.7 million. But the governor has been starting a PR campaign to get more shots in arms of folks in this state because, of course, they're now hitting a plateau when it comes to vaccinations, Mm -hmm. as we've been seeing across this country because of vaccine hesitancy, which so many of us have been reporting on, guys. Yep. Something else happening all across the country that we're keeping an eye on. Yasmin, thank you so much. Now to India, which is facing its worst surge since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Life-saving ventilators and much-needed oxygen supplies have started to arrive, and the U.S. is promising to send more supplies. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel reports on the country's desperate battle. Savannah, Joe, the World Health Organization said what is happening in India is beyond heartbreaking. This is a country that produces much of the world's vaccines, yet it has only fully vaccinated 2 percent of the population. There is now anger there. People are desperate. 
They don't have enough oxygen. Hospitals are turning people away because the beds are full and because they don't have oxygen tanks. So people are turning to the local community. They're turning to religious leaders. Temples are providing, where they can find it, oxygen tanks. And there are long lines. People are traveling for days to get to these places, these few places that have oxygen containers. The government is urging calm. It is telling the population not to panic. Uh, the government has reached out to the United States and President Biden has promised to urgently send aid. But they need the aid because currently they are overwhelmed. The, the country is seeing the highest number of new COVID cases per day than anywhere at any time during the pandemic. So this is a major problem for, for India, obviously, but for the entire world. This is the second most populous nation on Earth. And right now the virus is spreading more or less uncontrolled. And when it spreads uncontrolled, India already has its own variant, the more likely it is that new variants can emerge. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died from COVID-19, each one with a unique story. But some of those stories, specifically of the lives of undocumented workers, have remained untold until now. One New York City artist is trying to change that, highlighting their lives in a new art installation on the streets of New York and advocating for change in the process. These seven people who died while they were undocumented, they are critical and foundational to this country and culture. I am a daughter of an immigrant. I am also an immigrant myself. It is my life's work to share and uplift the stories of undocumented immigrants. From one person to one person to one person, I found seven people who were willing to share their story with me. I didn't know anyone beforehand. All these seven people are not connected. They don't know one another either, but they share a trauma, a deep, deep trauma with each other. I'm here because I was here to remember my dad because he passed away from COVID-19. And I remember how he was a hard worker, which makes me sad because I won't be able to be with him anymore. Essentially, my father was a victim from this virus and, you know, he worked all his life, you know, for, he worked in this country for over 30 years with no benefit. I miss her every day. Today, for me, this is a very important day because it demonstrates me that our people is essential, that our people is important. There are thousands of immigrants living amongst us, and yet they're working so hard, just like you and I. Immigrants should be recognized in this country for what they do, for all the effort they put. 69% of undocumented workers are essential workers. Undocumented people were essential to making sure that this country did not fall apart in the height of the pandemic. We need to give them a pathway to citizenship because it is the right thing to do, it is the fair thing to do. Coming up, unidentified aerial phenomena caught on tape. What are they? And is there a threat to our national security? Aye, 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 that's next. A series of mystery sightings in the sky are raising national security concerns. The Pentagon confirms the images are being reviewed by a task force set to brief Congress on what they know about what they are calling unidentified aerial phenomenon. NBC News' Gotti Schwartz has more. More questions and answers about what appeared to be an upside down pyramid flying over a Navy destroyer off the coast of California and a series of pictures showing another mysterious object fly into the water near another warship in 2019. The images obtained by documentary filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. The Pentagon confirming the images are being reviewed by a task force set to brief Congress on what they know about what they call unidentified aerial phenomenon. On YouTube, some suggest it could be planes mistaken by lens blurring. Others point to ship logs that called the objects drones or UAVs. But a former official of a Pentagon program that dealt with advanced aerial threats says for years, the U.S. military has encountered mysterious objects that seem capable of traveling more than 11,000 miles an hour or able to transition from air to water without slowing down. Some of these videos are, 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 are 20, 25 minutes long. 
In other cases, uh, these things are, are 50 feet away from the cockpit. But he says most alarming are incursions over restricted nuclear assets. We've actually had some of our, our nuclear capabilities disabled by these things. If Russia or China had the ability to disable our our, our, our nuclear strike capability or defense capability, um, that's that's pretty significant. That's a concern. And we reached out to the Pentagon about those alleged incursions. They say they do not comment on intelligence matters and that Lou Elizondo left the Pentagon in 2017 and does not speak for the Department of Defense. It is time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC senior markets correspondent Dominic Chu joins us now. Hey, Dom, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. We are keeping a close eye on shares of Tesla today, the electric car maker reporting quarterly earnings and sales that both beat Wall Street forecasts thanks to a ramp up in production in China and continued strong demand for electric vehicles, those EVs worldwide. But Tesla's profits are being squeezed by supply chain issues and lower selling prices for its older models. CEO Elon Musk says Tesla is facing, quote unquote, insane difficulties with a whole range of parts. Uh, Amazon is, is expanding a delivery service that lets people get drop-offs inside their garages to more than 5,000 cities nationwide. This is all part of Amazon Key, which allows drivers to leave packages in garages, homes, cars, and businesses. Customers have to buy additional hardware, including a smart lock, a camera, and a garage door opener. Amazon has pitched this service as a way to keep orders safe from things like weather, damage, and of course, theft. And speaking of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, the space company Blue Origin, has filed a protest with the Government Accountability Office against NASA. The company is challenging the award of a nearly $3 billion moon lander contract to Elon Musk's SpaceX. The two were also competing against a third bidder, with NASA expected to pick two of those three teams for the contract. In a statement to CNBC, Blue Origin called the SpaceX pick flawed adding that NASA moved the goalposts at the last minute. But Savannah, Joe, it's always crazy to see the world's richest men like Jeff Bezos (laughs) and Elon Musk battling it out on the business side of things. And then, of course, on the space side of things. Back over to you. Yeah, it really is. All while preparing to host SNL for Elon (laughs) Musk. Right. (laughs) He's a guy. There you go. (laughs) All right, Tom, thank you so much. Now, we've all been trying to figure out how to live with COVID. Well, many TV shows are debating how to portray COVID on screen. And medical dramas in particular face a unique challenge. One of them that you definitely know and likely love faced it head on with its main character even suffering from a severe case. Here's more on what you might see in some of your favorite shows. We were definitely worried about, you know, the fact that people are going through it in real life. Do they want to continue to go through it on the show? You know, you hear about reports, but people don't take that in as much as when it's coming into their living rooms and it's occurring to people that they know and love, you know, with our characters. I think that people really got a, a even better sense of how it was affecting not only doctors, but um, just other families. There definitely was talk about picking up in a post-COVID world. Even medical shows chose to, you know, do COVID for one episode and then jump into a post-COVID world. I was really struck by how Grey's Anatomy, like, went right at COVID. You know, most other shows don't do it at all. Most other shows are like, we don't really want to, we want to be in a fantasy world where COVID never happened. You know, they're set in Seattle and Seattle was ground zero for the first wave of COVID cases. So to not have, you know, to to, to try and skip it and pretend it didn't happen would almost be, you know, a, a little insulting to the city that they've been portraying for all these years. Episode about Bailey's mom dying was based on my mom, although she did not die of COVID. She had COVID. We're at the hospital. Now? Right now. Mom. She was hospitalized and then in the rehab center and then back at a new place. And she also has Alzheimer's. It was uh, it was a 
a complete journey, as it were. And Grays kind of let me finish that journey. It was helpful and cathartic. I was very grateful to have written that episode. We had to like frame our storytelling differently by reducing the number of people. It made some of those scenes more poignant. And then, you know, it also gave us creative ways to um, get people out of masks, you know, like creating the backyard for Meredith's house, it create, you know, creating spaces outside, like in parks and in the breezeway and all that kind of, kind of things so that people could unmask and speak to each other. The thing about Grey's Anatomy is that it's really gotten very activist in its old age. And they check the trunk and then they check the car. And I, I've been having to unpack all my stuff and uh, the police dog sniffed it over. What? It's a real move by Grey's to be like, no, we're here and we're making statements and we have opinions and we think your entertainment should talk about these things. We're not like a drawn from the headlines kind of um, show usually, but in the face of just so much going on and the racial reckoning that occurred and seeing having COVID bring up a lot of these issues and bring them to the forefront. It's part of the storytelling. It's part of the medicine. It's part of our character's journey. When people look back on this season, it's kind of like a little time capsule, um, which I'm really proud of. The isolation that everybody was feeling, the feeling from the doctors that we were doing everything we can, but that was nothing. All the death and all the the scariness of the time, I think we really were able to portray that. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.